you everybody for coming. Thank you, Annette, for um, making this museum possible and this award possible. It's really been a great experience. I think I got the news about a year and a half ago, and I had uh, four solo shows scheduled within that year and a half. And so this would be my fifth one. And a couple of them were based on loans and everything else. So anyway, I already had a busy year, but it was you know, definitely a blessing to be able to focus on doing a show, thinking about it being in the same place for longer than a month, and really being able to uh, share my work with uh, my hometown now. Um, the, sh the title of the show is Elemental, and I was thinking about several different things when I came up with the title. I have a daughter who's three years old, and we've been thinking about elementary education for her, and at the same time, I've always had sort of a fascination with basic symbols and signs and tools uh, that communicate or educate um, or basically you know, try to uh, attempt to transfer any type of message to an audience. So I've always been fascinated with uh, books and charts and maps and that type of graphic design, um, that type of uh, visual thinking visual communication and I was thinking about how much things have changed since I was a kid and of course the primary uh, conveyor of content that most of us grew up with, like hopefully all of us, uh, would be books and that has just completely changed in the last uh, 10 to 20 years. Um, and I was also thinking about the idea that uh, working with material and sort of breaking it down to its basic elements. So those are some of the really basic ideas behind the title. Uh, I'm going to speak very casually, probably walking around the space since everybody's sort of in the center. I'll talk about this piece and then walk around this way and hopefully uh, different people will be in the front row or whatever. Um, just ask me a question, raise your hand or just blurt out uh, whenever you have a question. So keep it very casual. Um, this piece is called Totem, uh, I'm sorry, it's called Tower One Britannica and it's a full set of Encyclopedia Britannica from 1958. And I have been working with books for over 10 years now, and at the time I was feeling really guilty about it, and I had only seen a few other artists working with books, mostly uh, Buzz Spector, Doug Bue, um, other artists that have been working since the 60s, 70s with the book as material, really thinking about the uh, objectness of a book. Um, but when I did start, I had never really seen anybody working with books in the way uh, that I have, and people were sort of disturbed by the fact that I was working with books and now it's almost to the point where I'm disturbed by a lot of the emails I get from teachers that have extra books and they want me to teach them so that uh, their class can all alter books together um, in between iPad sessions or something. Um, but basically I've always uh, loved the Encyclopedia Britannica. It's definitely one of the uh, richest visually and conceptually uh, one of the richest uh, encyclopedia sets. and. 2010, they announced that was going to be the last printed edition. So it was just uh, one of the you know, further things that really motivated me to specifically focus on Britannica uh, for this show and with, with other pieces as well. Um, so basically what you're looking at is just a full set of encyclopedias, no additional material other than varnish, and every single page, thanks to my assistant, is uh, weaved into the next page. So it's really, uh, the books are really embracing each other uh, and holding each other up uh, in the tower with the support of uh, you know, each piece. And then of course, they're sort of turned inside out so you can see the, the covers on the inside. And um, with all of my work, once I seal up the book in the form that it's uh, going to be taking, uh, I have no idea what I'm gonna come across when I start carving. It's really subtractive, uh, pretty basic uh, sculptural process from there. So I'm literally, it's like reading, I'm just removing one layer at a time and whatever I come across, I, um, it's really, it's almost a binary process also because I'm either, uh, you know, almost approaching it like a computer. I'm either keeping something or I'm removing something and kind of going from there. So there's a lot of different ways I like to think about the way uh, I approach my work. Um, so with this piece, I really wanted to create a tower, sort of an ode to uh, a bygone era, um, also sort of presenting it like a totem almost uh, if you think about most things that are in a natural history museum, they are being presented as art or as history, but they did have a specific function or spe specific purpose when they were originally created, but now they're sort of uh, just appreciated for their history or their aesthetic uh, value. And so I wanted to uh, parallel 
books uh, sort of use that as an analogy to put them in that position of, as natural history. Um, so I'll probably go on to my second piece here. This is also from a full set of Encyclopedia Britannica's. It's called 24-bit. And I was originally inspired by the inside design on the cover. Uh, this set is from 1929, uh, which is interesting because it's between the two world wars. And one thing that I, uh, you realize when you look at a lot of old books is right after World War I is right when flight initially became accessible to at least uh, high-class Europeans, um, or upper-class, I should say, not high-class, um, upper-class Europeans. And so they were the first ones to sort of fly around, come back with their stories for the encyclopedias and, you know, as politically incorrect as their stories were and how singular their voice was, um, that was what people were being, what people were learning. And it was really the first opportunity for uh, a larger audience to uh, explore new worlds in a way. Um, so there's a lot of interesting content that uh, should be dissected and sort of questioned within these books, but at the same time, I'm also thinking about not only the physical loss of the book and the fact that we're constantly losing information uh, physically, but now that we're saving everything online <clears throat> or in the cloud or on Facebook or wherever you save your photographs and your ideas and everything, uh, you know, it's um, even less uh, tangible. It's even more vulnerable to the electric grid, and uh, you know, it's 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 even better for the companies that are selling you that information for them to hold on to it, and for you to have no physical backup. You know, every time you need, if your laptop crashes and you have all of your audio books or your e-books on there, you lose all of that also, and you have to purchase that all again. And that, of course, is the main driver behind a lot of this technology. It's not necessarily accessibility. It's also the fact that you won't be able to access it in the future and you'll have to continue purchasing. At least that's my paranoid theory. <laughs> uh, so this is partially inspired by uh, that design and the idea of the cloud and the idea of uh, just sort of this virus or these technical um, bits, this system that's sort of uh, intruded and interrupted into, into the set of, uh, of books. So by being 24-bit, each piece is 8 bits, which is exactly the number of bits used, uh, required to create a letter on, the, on a computer. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Yeah. Um, if, if I didn't correctly, you sort of describe it as a computer that has the ability to create a letter and then Yeah. yeah. But how do you how do you think about that also in thinking to the fact that you are in fact connecting that through the process of physically exploring the world and then the example the way you can say I yeah, I know exactly what you're um yeah, because a lot of people ask if I've ever worked with like a rare edition of a book or something that's like, you know specifically unique. And you know, I always say that I like to suggest the idea of a loss of information, but not actually participate in it. Of course, I am slowly, one book or one set of books at a time, I am actually participating in that. So there is, uh, you know, a little bit of a discomfort in that, but also something that makes it more aligned to what I'm actually uh, talking about. But I never want to, um, there are still hundreds of, of this specific set out there. And if I do find a book that I think is really rare, uh, I'll look it up online, I'll do research. A lot of times I'll buy a backup copy just for myself. So I have almost a library of books. A lot of times I'll find a book and it's just so fascinating. I think, oh, this is so amazing. I want to keep this book for myself. Um, and then I you know, just can't help myself and I want to work with it. So then I'll look up and I'll, I'll buy a backup copy. But I always sort of make sure uh, there's a few backup copies out there. And almost like a natural history museum, the animal has to be dead in order to uh, you know, be able to present it in a, in a frozen state. So um, we'll walk around this way. Uh, these three pieces are the pieces that uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art of Georgia here uh, acquired for their collection. And they're three unique pieces, but 
when I saw the titles, I thought they worked well together. There's the emergence of society, man in contemporary society, and then who killed society. And so they're individual pieces, but they really tell a story almost like a, a graphic novel would uh, in a linear fashion. Uh, and also sort of um, you know, talking about that connection between information and education and society and uh, what is happening now that, um, uh, you know, for the better part, information, all the information is accessible to, you know, almost everybody, uh, you know, at least in the Western world. Um, but at the same time, uh, we're sort of losing that hierarchy of uh, education and that hierarchy of uh, authorship that um, has, you know, created these books initially. So it's, it's definitely a balance right now. We're sort of teeter-tottering as, uh, you know, people's thoughts on Facebook are getting more followers than, uh, you know, a philosopher's uh, new book might. So, you know, it's really interesting to see what's happening there. But this is really sort of the uh, basic format that I started with around 2001, just sealing the edges of the book, carving in from there, and sort of pulling out this three-dimensional collage, this diorama, and a lot of people were comparing me, my work to Joseph Cornell, uh, which I can see, but uh, the misconception is that I'm assembling things when it's really a completely uh, subtractive process. And I do like the fact that the book is framing it, it almost becomes like a picture, um, but it also sort of pushed me to further the potential shape of the book so that uh, it really becomes more of a sculpture, more of an object than, than a collage or a series of pictures. Uh, that was just sort of a little joke. I did want to keep the original titles, but by erasing the author, I'm, you know, erasing the author and uh, signing my name in there. Um, but I never want to take credit for the actual images or words that are um, in my work, just the way that I'm representing them. So I always try to maintain or balance that, that uh, ethical honesty, at least, you know, so you know, and you can easily, you know, look up the, the original authors. So sometimes I'll do that with a specific publisher. In a way, it also sort of makes the book uh, less specific to exactly what it is and more of a more generic or general uh, symbol of a book or symbol of the ideas, the, the information within, within inside. If that makes sense. How long did it take you to carve out one phrase? It takes a while. <laughs> do you do one book at a time or do you have time to self working on stuff? Usually, uh, I think like most artists will work this way. If I'm working on a large project, there'll be a lot of uh, setup time and drying time in between and everything. And also just you sort of need that uh, mental and physical break from something that's really large. So I'll usually be focusing on one large piece and have uh, something smaller on the side. But once I sort of get into something, I'm usually focusing just on, on one piece. Do you use an exact thing? Yeah, I use exact exactly. Yeah, Actually, exact though, that's like saying jello. That's yeah. a commercial. I use Excel brand craft knives, but everybody <laughs> thinks of them as exact. They're actually better than exact. <laughs> and I use tweezers to remove every single little layer. And I have a lot of other little tools that I've sort of invented along the way that help me work. <laughs> sort of. I try not to be. I try to get it out in the studio. <laughs> No, I, well, I actually used to be like I'd seal the edges, it's solid, then I'd carve, then I'd varnish. Um, but uh, as things sort of teeter-totter on the verge of completely falling apart, it's more like carving, varnishing, carving, varnishing, carving, varnishing. So um, in order to, yeah, in order for it to not completely fall apart. Well, I'm not placing anything. The book is really, you know, it's a series of flat layers. Okay. And so I'm cutting into it and removing one layer at a time. All I'm doing is removing. I'm not adding. Not nothing's being moved or nothing's being added, and I have no idea what I'm going to come across. So that's what's exciting for me. Um, so there's really a high level of chance, and it's really, you know, an interaction between me and the book. And I, you know, I'm pretty honest about the process, and I'm 
um, sort of like I set up these rules for myself and sort of strict about them because in a way it kind of frees things up and um, makes things more exciting for me because I have no idea what's going to happen. Um, you're working with it and what takes psychological design. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and sometimes I'll have a specific agenda like before I approach a book to um, pull out uh, certain, you know, elements of uh, a book to show, you know, to show something about it, basically. But a lot of times I'll let that just happen naturally, and the book will sort of dictate that. For the most part, not. I'll skim through the book. I almost don't want to know the book too well, and a lot of it's um, either reference books or nonfiction. The reference books you wouldn't really read from front to back anyway, and the nonfiction is sort of out of date. Um, you know, any of these aren't necessarily what I should be perceiving my world view on. So. Um, while I'm working, I'm constantly scanning the text almost on every page, so I am reading fragments in that way. And a lot of times I will read something really interesting and I'll make a little note and I'll buy the book later and look it up later or even search just that phrase and find it online. Uh, I use a couple different varnishes, and they sort of took me years to figure out uh, what they are, but they're made for paper-based work, and uh, I mean, the, the main one is like a Liquitex uh, acrylic matte medium, which has a UV protectant within it, so, and then if something's behind glass or flexi, it also has an additional layer of UV protection, but it took me a long time to get the, the viscosity just right so that it's not crumpling the pages and, uh, but yeah, we can, I can answer like specific little questions afterwards as well. Um, so this next piece is called Chaos, and uh, Ashley, my assistant, uh, just opened Straw Hat Press over at the Goat Farm, and they are a uh, printing press that is looking for work to do any addition to prints, um, anybody that's interested. So um, she was in the process of opening that. Uh, while she was working for me, and uh, Mocha GA was very generous by um, providing 300 hours of her work. We burned through that before the end of last year, and then I just hired her for two to three days a week, and so it's really working out well. Uh, and this is one of the pieces that they helped me print, um, and it was also a good amount of work for her. There's um, Basically what I did is I looked up the word chaos in a thesaurus. There's six synonyms. I looked those up ended up with 49 and it just kind of kept growing from there. There's over 2,600 words uh, in this piece and it's all drawn uh, by hand in Illustrator. So it's all drawn uh, individually um, on the computer. Uh, and basically every word would either be in the thesaurus so it could continue to grow uh, or it might have been uh, already repeated in a previous phase which those are the ones that are in red so there wasn't it would have been redundant for them to continue to grow and like the word chaos here it sort of uh, ends up falling into this perpetual loop um, reflecting back on itself or the words in black were the ones that just weren't in the source so they just died off so it's also sort of a metaphor for hyperlink uh, for the way we get information online now if you look up one word you might have six options you know or one site one click you might have six options, you click on those, some of them might be dead, some of them might take you back to where you were, or and grow from there. But um, even before thinking about that analogy, it was really just sort of a you know, very analytical way of uh, following the word chaos through five phases of synonyms. And it's amazing how uh, completely away from the word chaos you can get um, in just five uh, stages. And it, of course, could have continued to grow from there. Well, when I was uh, thinking about the piece, I'd been reading a lot about like chaos mathematics, and um, so that was part of the reason, and then also sort of this idea of just creating structure out of chaos, and uh, you know, even within my work, like a book itself can be overwhelming, it almost feels chaotic until you make some sort of sense out of it, either by reading it or by controlling it in a different way, which is what I do here. Um, so it, it is something that I'm constantly thinking about. And so I thought it was a strong word to, uh, to 
work, you know, to base this piece off of. Off of. <laughs> there have been comparisons to that, and that, that makes <laughs> it could be. If, Ke if uh, Kevin Bacon should be in the center, oh. and just the six degrees. I mean, eventually, you know, you can never have all the words, but um, I'm sure every word could relate to chaos in probably less than six steps, you know, if you had the right thesaurus and the right time. Figure that out. <laughs> so this is a series of six books. Uh, they're all based on puzzles. And one of the ideas behind sort of this uh, elementary concepts was with the flag and the maps and the charts. Um, I was thinking about game books and games really being an analogy for my work as well. Uh, and they're sort of also just a little, um, definitely a lot of fun to work on. And all these books are from the 40s through the 60s. And it's interesting how the structure and the uh, architecture of games sort of dictated uh, the structure of the piece. And if you think about a book, it's really the, the form of a book almost has nothing to do with the content ever. And so what I'm trying to do is by having the content, uh, by carving around the content, I'm literally the content is creating the form. So there's really sort of this uh, hidden uh, structure, hidden matrix that's sort of revealed within these pieces. And a lot of the language within games is a lot of fun too. And once it becomes isolated, it uh, completely takes on different meaning. Like this is a book on bridge and end up finding uh, you know, when, however, you hold a hand past the desirable partner, will of course carry on. He will find out that he will be possibly a losing heart. Um, so there's a lot of little poetry that I'm pulling out of the, the pieces themselves. Do you ever remove something only to continue on? And yeah. <laughs> uh, as long as they're going exactly where they were, if they pop, I can do that, yeah. But I'm always you know, real strict about it. So uh, this was my first uh, attempt at book burning. It's uh, 84 romance paperback books. And uh, I basically used a torch and a uh, spray bottle of water so that I didn't burn the piece completely. Um, but there is no door here. Everybody, um, well, I've seen a few things written um, saying that I put books on top of a door. There is like a, a piece of plywood holding the, the whole thing together. Um, but it's really all you're seeing is the actual book sanded down and then um, burnt down. And it, in a way, it's sort of, um, because they're romance novels, in a way, it's, a, it's sort of a female form. It's also, uh, if you think about um, thinking about archaeology and thinking about the fact that we do actually have physical books and there is actually a phys physical structure there, but um, you know, if there is a threat of uh, fire or flood, we could actually you know, lose our books. Um, and now that everything's online, there, you know, all of those threats are uh, a lot more instantaneous and a lot more real. Um, and also thinking about this idea of uh, escapism and the idea of going into uh, a portal or an, a, a different space, basically, when you're, when you're reading. And it could also be an emergency exit. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, to get the, the coloration, basically, yeah. So, I mean, it, I really wanted it to be, you know, sort of about that, that illusion. Um, that one is called The Family Game Book. So it's a little bit of everything. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> uh, so this last piece, uh, One Word at a Time, is also a series of uh, paperback books, and they're all... Um, I've always been on the fence about it's basically every Stephen King novel that he's ever, ever um, published. And I was sort of thinking of him, not specifically his work, but more of just an icon of uh, sort of a male uh, icon of popular literature. Um, and when he was asked how he writes books, he said basically one word at a time, which was sort of his snarky comment. But I also thought it was uh, just sort of relevant for my work as well but also um, really re like 
just sort of a peaceful message in a way, and almost a, a meditative message. And it almost feels like one step at a time, um, one word at a time, but it's also uh, you're sort of absorbing all of it uh, at the same time, you know, as as a piece, as opposed to reading it from front to back. Yeah, it's every single Stephen King novel. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. <laughs> so let's see, I'll keep going on this way. So this last piece uh, is the Altered States flag series. And I'd been thinking about this for a long time. Um, you could essentially have one large altered book. Uh, each state flag is from a different page in uh, a book on the 50 state flags. And just sort of thinking about local politics, uh, regional cliches, um, historical, uh, little historical stories you know, behind the states. Um, so there's sort of a little hidden thing about the state within each piece. And just like with my books, as you know, sort of um, keeping this rule that I had to use 100% of the image of the flag and couldn't add anything, basically. So I'm sort of limited by uh, the colors and the iconography and the symbols that are already there. Um, so it was, it was a lot of fun to work on. And I'm sure from the uh, perspective that you guys are at right now, you can easily see that it's actually a map of the United States. But I think during the opening, and a lot of people that just come up to it right away don't even realize that and don't necessarily understand the patterning behind it. So um, some of them have a lot of history and significance, and then some of them are just sort of uh, adolescent ideograms and um, are just uh, sort of playing around with the, the structure and the shapes of the, the flags. Yeah, I did start with books around 2001, and um, I've noticed there's sort of an emerging genre of altered books sort of coming out right now, both mostly with um, people that are uh, like around my age. And I think what's interesting is like, you know, like I completely grew up in school with books, and then like right when I was done with school, like, you know, books just became less and less, uh, you know, relevant or necessary for everyday life at least, you know, as far as the way we acquire information. Um, so I think that's something that I saw happening uh, when I started working with books. But did I think that the Encyclopedia Britannica was going to completely stop printing in 2010? You know, I didn't think that was going to happen so soon. Um, you know, and you know, I was just talking to a college professor who was saying there are new students now who are only 18. If you think about it, they were only eight <laughs> 10 years ago, I mean, and they completely grew up on uh, e-books and without having physical books um, as a part of their, you know, daily lives. So, um, you know, my work, like, I do want people to think about the relevance of books. Uh, of course, there's, you know, I think, of course, the, the internet is amazing and it's great, um, but it's important to understand that th there should be a balance and that there should be, uh, you know, to a degree, I think everything will sort of fall back into place, but to a degree there, you know, definitely should be a hierarchy of information. There should be things that um, are saved uh, in physical form, uh, because if we, you know, we could basically be in a post-historic era if we lose electricity for five to ten years and all of our records are, you know, save electronically 200 years from now, there might just be like a little dark chart on the map and like, you know, everything might be just lost from a, from a specific era of time. Uh, each piece is kind of its own thing, um, but I do try to continue to push uh, both physically and conceptually, um, you know, the potential of the, the form.
Yeah, this, uh, this piece specifically was interesting because I found four little uh, just handwritten notes about different gods and inside the book, so I thought it was sort of interesting. You can't really tell right now because the whole setup back here, but they're sort of aligned with the shadows of the piece uh, also. And, um, and then the other piece over there, the door piece, there was also another little uh, religious memo thing. So I thought it was interesting that everything I was finding within the books, um, for the most part, had something to do with some type of religion. So, um, you know, and in a way, this piece back here can almost be seen as an altar piece and, you know, almost the idea of uh, information as, as a religion, you know. When you're, when you're working on books and you reach an image that you like, and you call that a stopping point, do you ever go 10 more layers down and see a hint of something else and then change your mind? Or do you always stop where you stop and everything underneath is uh, no, there is a lot of push and pull in my work. Um, you know, it is completely subtractive, but almost like a painter might be working something out, um, something else might emerge somewhere else, and then all of a sudden this doesn't make sense either aesthetically or conceptually, and so then this, which was there, I, I'll continue carving into. Or, you know, now that something emerged here, these three things make sense and I should search for more that, you know, that ties into that. So. Um, so there is, you know, it is completely subtractive, um, but there is sort of like going back and forth and um, thinking about things in that in that way. But when I do have something and then I, I you know, and I'm satisfied with it, and then I realize it's not working, uh, it's always sort of a risk because I have no idea what's what's going to be underneath there. Front to back, yeah, um, yeah. I'm basically just carving out like a style and piece of material. I mean, sometimes if I have a book that I'm carving into the back, I guess it would be, you know, back to front. Any other questions? I have. I did a some time, and I listen to a lot of audiobooks while I'm working. Um, so I recently did a, a piece on Brave New World, um, and I had read it years ago, um, but I figured I'll listen to it while I'm working on it. So that was sort of interesting, and then there's always sort of those moments where the, the same concept pops up in the work while I'm listening to it. But, you know, I definitely, uh, I do a lot of reading. Most of the reading I do now is in audiobook form, though, because I have a lot more listening time than I have reading time. So I try to be in the studio as much as possible. Thank you, Brian. Thank you.